So welcome back, everyone, uh, for the second talk of the day. Uh, just before I make the introductions, a, a few reminders. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask on uh, app.sli.do, and the code is hashtag NSEC20. Uh, questions can be upvoted, so make sure to uh, read the questions before you ask your own. Uh, also, make some noise on Twitter. Uh, the handle is uh, at NSEC underscore IO. Uh, we always like to have uh, attendees make a little bit of noise for us and also make sure to take note of the code of conduct it's something really important for us that we instruct uh, we enforce quite strictly and that we like uh, people to read it because we spend a lot of time uh, writing it so without further ado let me uh, introduce uh, our next speaker his name is uh, Holger Unterbrink and uh, Holger is working for Cisco Talos the threat research organization of Cisco uh, their goal is to find and reverse engineer new unknown malware campaigns. Uh, and his team uncovered attacks like Notpedia, WannaCry, DNS Pionage, Sea Turtle, and many more. Uh, he is frequently presenting on inter uh, international, uh, internal and external conferences. For example, Microsoft Digital Crime Consortium, Google Annual Reverse, uh, reverse Engineering Meeting, FIRST uh, ISC, uh, the fourth international conference on cybersecurity and privacy Balkan, besides Munich, SEC IT Germany, Cisco Live, and many more. Uh, his talk is going to be Dynamic Data Resolver uh, EDA plugin, extending EDA with uh, dynamic data. So thank you, Holger, and uh, please proceed. Hi, and welcome to the live stream of my presentation, Dynamic Data Resolver. My name is Holger Unterbrink and I'm a security researcher at Cisco Talos, mainly looking into malware research, threat hunting and tool development. I'm based in Germany and if you like to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at hunterbr72. Today I would like to introduce you in a new tool which I have um, developed in the last month and which I'm releasing next week, the Dynamic Data Resolver. Dynamic Data Resolver is mainly an IDA plugin, which goal it is uh, to resolve dynamic values like registers, for example, or memory values at runtime by using instrumentation. Uh, so if you're interested in ESI, in something like call ESI, uh, and you want to know the value of ESI, you can use DDR to resolve it. And uh, to guide you through the main features uh, of DDR, let me uh, proceed with the one which I've already mentioned. So finding dynamic values. You can not only resolve these absolute values like uh, you have seen before, which are stored in a certain operand or in, an, in a certain register. Uh, you can also uh, resolve pointers and pointer pointers which are stored in these operands. And uh, you can get the memory they are pointing to. So um, <clears throat> if you are analyzing an unpacking routine, for example, and you see that uh, EDI is uh, pointing to a buffer which, is, uh, which has uh, the MZ at the beginning, then uh, you might be lucky that uh, you have found the um, next stage of the unpacking routine which constructed the PE header. And this is just one example where it can help you um, to, uh, to analyze a an, uh, malware sample statically. Of course, there are hundreds of others, uh, other things like uh, crypto routines uh, and uh, many, many other things uh, where it is pretty handy to get these dynamic values inside of your static analyzers. As far as uh, DDR uh, is almost instrumenting every single instruction of the executable, depending on uh, what you have, uh, what command you have uh, picked, uh, you can also uh, easily use it for code coverage. And DDR is not only marking the instructions which were executed, uh, it is also marking it with a certain color depending on how often uh, the instruction was executed. Uh, if you see an instruction which, uh, which is marked uh, light green, you know it was executed once. If you um, see an instruction with, uh, let's say, a dark red, uh, with a much warmer color, then uh, you know uh, that it was executed many more times. 
And with this, uh, it helps you to find, for example, crypto routines, which are often looping uh, through the same basic blocks, etc., etc. It is also collecting um, all the jumps, calls, and uh, similar instructions, which are touching uh, API calls. So um, anytime uh, one of these instructions tries uh, to access an API call, it is written into this table. And the table, of course, is uh, searchable. So if you're looking for a certain API call, like virtual alloc or Lord library, uh, you can just hit Control F and search for it. If you then do a double click on um, the line, it, uh, it brings you directly to, um, the, um, to the program counter inside of your disassembly uh, to the location where um, this API call was accessed. Uh, uh, so you can see exactly the instruction which uh, tried to access this API call in your disassembly. Pretty much the same applies for strings. DDR tries to collect interesting memory location, which are looking like strings. So uh, <clears throat> it is putting all of them uh, in this table, which means you can search for certain strings like MZ or anything else you're interested in, and then again do a double click uh, on the line and it brings you to the instruction which uh, accessed this, um, this string at runtime. You can also dump buffers in a smart way. You just have to hand over three parameters to a DDR, the uh, buffer size, the buffer address, and uh, the um, actual location where you want to dump the buffer or when you want to dump the buffer. You're doing that by um, <coughs> marking the um, operand, which stores the size, for example, and then you are selecting a use marked operand to get buffer size. So at runtime, DDR will read the value from this operand, no matter if it is an absolute value, like you can see here on the slide, the C8, or uh, if it is a register or something like that. Uh, you're doing the same for the buffer address and um, for um, the location where you want to dump the buffer. Uh, so if you have something like uh, virtual alloc, you know that um, the uh, function returns uh, a pointer to the allocated buffer in RAX. So you would mark RAX and pick the uh, use marked operand to get buffer address menu point. Then uh, you're looking in your disassembly uh, where this buffer is filled with something you're interested in. You're marking the line and you pick the mark address to dump uh, buffer to file uh, menu point and you are done. Yeah? The only thing which is left is uh, you have to execute the sample and dump the buffer. And of course, uh, you can do that multiple times in the executable. Uh, so you can dump multiple buffer buffers in uh, one step. Of course, uh, today malware uh, comes often with uh, anti-analyzing checks. And if you want to disable and patch these uh, anti-analyzing checks, you have three different options. You can either use uh, the knob out functionality by uh, marking these uh, instructions which you want to disable, and then they are getting knobbed out at runtime. Or if you want uh, to manipulate the control flow, you can just patch certain flags in the eFlag register. Uh, so if you have a conditional jump, for example, something like uh, jump not zero, uh, you can mark the line, you can click toggle eFlag uh, at runtime, and you would uh, manipulate the zero flag, for example, and toggle it, which means that at runtime, uh, it would get the exact opposite value, which means uh, the jump would do it the exact opposite, opposite thing uh, than it would do uh, if you would execute uh, the sample in a normal way. And last but not least, um, you can also completely skip functions if you like. Uh, if you have a function, let's say something which uh, detects a virtual machine um, and you want to skip it, <coughs> you can completely skip it and uh, return a faked return value which means um, that um, the, um, uh, the other parts of the sample getting a faked return value, which is telling uh, the rest of the sample something like, uh, okay, uh, we, didn't found, um, we didn't found any virtual machine, we can proceed, we don't have to exit, we haven't found any, any analyzing stuff, um, so uh, no debugging or anything like that. We can just uh, execute our malicious uh, functions. Huh? So you can skip the function and fake any return value which you would like. If all of that is uh, not enough uh, to do a static analysis um, of the sample, you can also create an uh, x64 debug script. Uh, 
And uh, when you're creating the x64 debug script with uh, DDR, it builds a script which is uh, also applying all um, the patches which you have uh, set up before. Yeah, all, the patch, uh, all the patches which I've talked about on the slide before. And it is um, writing them into an x64 debug script and using the x64 debug um, uh, script language to implement these, uh, these patches. And then it is breaking at um, the address which you have uh, highlighted in IDA. Uh, so you can just execute the script inside of x64 debug and it will automatically break at the point which you have marked in IDA. And then you can proceed uh, working with x64, uh, x64 debug uh, like you always do. If you don't like uh, x64 debug, <coughs> you can also uh, create an executable with an endless loop at the marked address. Uh, so you can mark a certain uh, address in your disassembly, you cr create an executable and the original executable gets patched with an endless loop. Uh, so it's over, it's, um, it's uh, DDR is it's, uh, overwriting two bytes. Uh, so when you're executing the uh, executable, um, it is uh, looping forever. So you have time to um, uh, attach a debugger to it, your favorite debugger, which you would like. And uh, then you just have to replace these uh, patched bytes, the two ones. You can use the DDR output for that, uh, like you can see here on the bottom um, of, the, of, the, of the slide. And then you're just replacing the original, uh, the original bytes back and then you can just proceed debugging with your favorite debugger. Okay, so this is what you can do with uh, DDR. Let me talk a little bit about the architecture of DDR. Um, it is highly recommended um, to um, uh, use the uh, plugin on one machine and uh, use the DDR server and uh, the Dynamorai client on a separate machine. Keep in mind that uh, we are doing instrumentation and we are really executing the malware. And uh, you probably don't want to execute the malware on the same uh, machine where uh, your IDA uh, and your IDA license is uh, running on. So um, we would highly recommend uh, to use two virtual machines, for example, one where you have uh, running IDA and another one where you um, run the server component and uh, the actual instrumentation DLL. Of course, you can run it on the same box, but uh, again, it is not recommended. The way it works is that um, the IDA plugin is sending the commands to the DDR API server, and the DDR API server is controlling a command line tool, the Denemorio client. Yeah. This is a client which you can also run standalone. Yeah. For example, if you want to analyze the sample on a completely air-gapped system, yeah, and uh, you don't want uh, to access this it uh, via IDA. Uh, you can just um, install the Dynamo Rio client on that box, which is pretty easy. And um, you can put nothing else on this physical box. It's completely air-gapped. Um, this malware sample gets instrumented. It is collecting all the interesting data. It's writing this data to a JSON file. And then later on, you can, com copy, the, you can copy the JSON file um, to the analyst machine and read it into IDA if you like. And then you can use uh, the IDA plugin uh, pretty much the same way like uh, you would have used the plugin uh, from the beginning on. Uh, so these are the two options. Either you're running it manually on the command line or uh, you're doing everything from the IDA plugin and the whole process is uh, fully uh, automatic. As you have seen on the slide before, I'm using the Dynamo Rio instrumentation platform for doing all the instrumentation. And um, the reason for that is that um, Denemorai is an extremely rich uh, API for instrumentation. It comes with uh, a lot of different tools. Um, it comes with a lot of different API functions, which are helping you a lot when you are trying to implement something like that. So you don't have to think uh, you have to you don't have to think about uh, about a lot of um, underlying issues for all the different architectures, for example, and so on. Uh, um, no matter if it is uh, x64 bit or x32 bit, um, <coughs> Dynamorai is able to instrument uh, the binary no matter what uh, kind of sample you have. Dynamorai also comes with a uh, BSD license, which is pretty nice, so you can easily use it inside of uh, your tools. And um, another really important point is um, it is uh, supporting self-modifying code. 
And it can also trace files uh, which are starting uh, threads. It's multi-threaded capable, and it can even trace um, uh, new processes which uh, your sample is executing. And the probably most important thing, uh, it is really well documented. Uh, uh, I don't really want to compare it to, uh, to uh, Intel PIN, uh, but it is doing a pretty similar thing, um, except of um, that I like it a little bit more. And um, it is, at least in my, um, <laughs> from my point of view, a little bit better documented. The installation is also super, in, super simple. You just have to unpack a zip file and that's it. Uh, um, so it has a lot of advantages. And as far as we already have a pin tracer inside of IDA, I don't want to invent the wheel again. So I picked an MRIO uh, for this implementation. Dynamorio is around for at least uh, 10 years, I would say. It's uh, pretty stable uh, and again coming with a lot of features. And the main feature, or the most important feature, if you want to analyze uh, malware sample, samples, is probably that uh, it is built from scratch uh, with the idea of uh, being totally transparent to the instrumented uh, malware sample or to the instrumented sample. Uh, with this, um, you can still detect Dynamo Ryo if you're actively looking for it, but so far I haven't seen uh, much malware which is actually doing that. Uh, and hopefully even after the presentation that doesn't change, but uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So um, <clears throat> the way it works is uh, you are executing a Dynamo Ryo client by executing, for example, the drun.exe one. Uh, the DRUN tool, and um, you can use your own DLL, which is uh, the main engine of the instrumentation. Yeah, the DLL is collecting all the data, it is uh, controlling the instrumentation, and uh, then also sending, um, uh, sending the data back uh, to the JSON files. Uh, um, and uh, the way you would execute that on the command line is just uh, by um, the way you can see here on the slide. Yeah, DRUN, XE, DRL, DLL, uh, DDR, DLL, and then uh, the DDR, DLL config parameters, and then um, uh, the sample which you want to analyze. And the result, as I mentioned before, is a JSON file. And then you can either import the JSON file to IDA, or um, you have done this whole process uh, automatically by using the IDA plugin. This is how the uh, JSON file looks like. And you can see that it is collecting pretty much all the registers uh, and all the interesting memory points um, or pointers um, at more or less every single instruction. Uh, and as far as uh, this is, of course, generating a certain um, overhead, uh, you have, an, you have uh, several options inside of DDR to only do the instrumentation for certain basic blocks, for example, or for, or for certain uh, ranges. Um, for certain instruction ranges inside of your executable. Uh, and uh, with this, it's still extremely fast, uh, even that fast that uh, even time measuring, uh, um, anti-analyzing uh, routines are often not detecting that uh, anything was instrumented. The whole workflow works like uh, you can see here on the slide. The first thing you have to do is uh, if you want to use the plugin, you are uh, executing the DDR server, uh, which is the API server, which you have seen before. Um, then you are uh, launching IDA on a different machine and uh, you're picking a command inside of DDR. Uh, you just do a right mouse click and uh, execute, for example, a light trace, which is uh, uh, tracing uh, through the whole segment, to the whole um, code segment, for example, and uh, collecting a certain amount of uh, data there. This command is uh, sent over, an, over an, an encrypted channel to the server. The server is then executing um, the Dynamo Rio command line and the DLL. The DLL is generating the JSON file and then finally the JSON file gets uh, sent to um, the uh, IDA plugin with, uh, by, the, by the server and then um, you can use this data inside of your static analysis yeah, by just right clicking on an operand or on, a, on an instruction line and uh, picking some of these uh, menus. Uh, so get value for source operand, for example, or get the value of a certain register, whatever you are interested in. By the way, um, you can see here on the right side of the screenshot, um, something like 
x ax uh, equal no data. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we haven't found any data. That just means that uh, the absolute value which was taught in eax is uh, the 27b6. And um, this is uh, just an absolute value which is not pointing to anything. Uh, so you know that um, there was not a pointer or pointer pointer stored inside of um, this register. It is just an absolute value which was used in the instruction. Um, <clears throat> before we are moving to the demo, let me quickly uh, warn you about a pretty nasty behavior of uh, Windows if it comes to uh, executing, executing Python scripts um, inside of a command window. Unfortunately, if you're marking any text inside of the window, um, inside of this command window, uh, Windows will freeze um, these, uh, this Python application. Uh, so it's not getting executed until um, you are hitting escape, uh, um, which means that uh, your DDR server is pretty much frozen. And uh, of course, it will not um, accept any uh, commands from the plugin anymore. Uh, uh, so if you are receiving a timeout error or something like that uh, on the IDA plugin side, it is very likely that you accidentally marked or highlighted something here in the uh, DDR server output and uh, that has frozen uh, the server. So you can either hit escape a couple of times and uh, the server gets executed again or um, if that doesn't help you, just uh, uh, do a control Z and restart the server. Uh, both works um, and then uh, you can proceed with the commands um, with the right mouse click in IDA in the plugin and everything works like before. Uh, but just be warned about that one. Try not to mark anything or if you're marking uh, text in the output window, make sure that you hit uh, escape a couple of times afterwards. So a quick final disclaimer, um, of course DDR is not replacing your brain. Of course you can do stupid things with it, it is uh, quite powerful. So keep in mind that um, something like uh, patching is, uh, might be dangerous and could crash the sample. Um, I've also seen malware which is uh, for example killing the whole process chain until Explorer XE. So uh, that would also kill uh, the Python server and uh, the communication would obviously not work anymore. But nevertheless, um, like uh, for any tool, it doesn't fit at all, but uh, at least it will fit uh, most of the samples and uh, hopefully it will help you with um, your analyzing. Okay, um, enough about that. Um, let's move to the demo and let me show you how the thing looks in real life. Actually, before we are switching to IDA, let me quickly um, show you the important parts of uh, the source code of the sample which we are going to analyze. The first thing um, is that uh, the sample is comparing um, its uh, process name with um, evilmalware.exe, which means if um, its process name is not evilmalware.exe, it will uh, copy an instance of itself to the temp folder and um, then it is executing this uh, instance. So the first uh, instance is just uh, leaving and uh, the second one is recognizing that it is running under the process name evilmalware.exe so the comparison is not true and um, it will uh, just print out this uh, message new instance running from temp folder and then proceed with uh, the rest of the code. Again, I don't want to go through all of the source code, just uh, the important parts for the demo. And one thing you should recognize is that uh, A can never be bigger than five. Yeah? We are doing a mod five here, so uh, there's uh, no chance that A can ever be bigger than five, which means that um, the following comparison will always be not true. Yeah? And um, it will always print out the uh, message a is not greater than five, at least in theory, because uh, we will see later on during the demo that uh, we can patch this behavior inside of uh, DDR. The last thing uh, which you should keep in mind for the demo is uh, that um, after this comparison, we have a dialog box, which is asking for a value. Uh, this value is getting assigned to A, but that's not really important. The important part is that you remember that there's a dialog box which uh, would stop the execution of uh, the sample. And of course, we don't want that. Uh, we want to uh, get it executed uh, in one step. So uh, we will also uh, knock out 
later on this um, this dialog box uh, and skip it. Okie dokie. Um, with this, um, let me switch over to IDA. Okay, so we've loaded uh, the sample into IDA and we move to the location where it is uh, comparing the process name with evilmalware.exe. So usually the sample would be executed uh, with a different process name and uh, it would go this path where it is uh, just copying itself and launching a second instance of itself. But of course we are not so much interested in this path, we are more interested uh, in the other path uh, and um, the rest of the sample code. So what we want to do is uh, we want to patch this comparison and um, we can do that by toggling the zero flag for example. Uh, it's a jump not zero, so uh, in, if we are inverting the zero flag uh, it is doing the exact opposite of uh, what it is supposed to do. So we go and go to uh, the DDR patch menu, toggle E flag, we are picking the zero flag, uh, the F flag, click OK and that's it. The next thing uh, which we want to do is um, we want to get rid of the dialog box as I mentioned before. So we are moving over to that part of the code, we are marking the code and uh, we can just knob out all these instructions at runtime. Uh, again, we are moving to the patch menu and uh, we are picking the knob out marked instruction at runtime option. So now um, we can execute another DDR command. So for example, we can run a trace if we want to get a code coverage, for example. Uh, we do that, um, we have to wait a little bit um, and uh, it has sent the um, command to the DDR server, the DDR server has executed it and sent back the analysis in form of the JSON format. So you can see here the light trace is done. If we are now moving back to um, the process check and um, if um, we highlight all the instructions which were actually traced, uh, we get a nice code coverage and uh, we can also see that um, <coughs> The other path was executed, even if the process name was not evil malware.exe, it uh, went this path and uh, it has executed all these, uh, all these instructions here. Uh -huh. And uh, it has also skipped that part at runtime. Before uh, I'm moving to the next feature, I would like to come back to uh, the warning which I have mentioned during uh, the presentation that uh, you should be very careful with marking the output text of uh, the DDR server. Uh, so for example, if uh, <clears throat> I'm moving over to the DDR server and um, if I'm marking something, uh, it can even be just one character as long as uh, something is marked in this uh, window, uh, the process is frozen. And uh, if we now try to execute a trace like we did before, for example, uh, then uh, it will run into a timeout. Uh, it takes a little bit and uh, pop, uh, you see, fail to run trace for segment. Uh, um, <clears throat> if you are running into this and if you want to test if uh, the communication is working between the server and uh, the IDA site, you can always test that uh, with your browser. Uh, if you're going to the root directory of uh, the server, uh, you can just uh, <coughs> uh, do that in your browser and you see that it is timing out. Uh, so. Um, if we are moving again over to the DDR server, uh, I can hit escape a couple of times uh, and you see all the commands are coming back in and uh, the application is now unfrozen again. If we are doing the test again, you see that uh, this uh, counter is now counting up and uh, the communication is working again. So I could now move back to IDA and uh, run the trace again or whatever I want to do. Uh -huh. And now the trace will be executed uh, as you have seen before. Uh, done. Okay, so after we have analyzed the sample uh, and we found an interesting buffer which we want to dump to disk, we can do that the way which I've mentioned during the presentation. Uh, so we have for example virtual alloc and we know that uh, this parameter is uh, the buffer size. So we can just go to the DDR menu dump and uh, we choose that one as uh, the buffer size. Then uh, we are marking RAX because we know that this is uh, uh, including the pointer which is pointing to the buffer and uh, we are heading that over to DDR. 
uh, get buffer address. So now um, we need to find um, the location in the code where uh, this buffer is filled with uh, something interesting, which is in this case here. So we are just marking the line and uh, we are handing over the third parameter to the dump and uh, we are done. Now we can now see that uh, DDR has all the parameters which are necessary to dump this buffer. So now we can finally execute the sample and uh, write the buffer to disk. So again, the sample gets executed and uh, the buffer gets dumped to disk. So uh, we can write it somewhere to the desktop, for example. And uh, you can see now it is the buffer which we have, or it's a string which we have copied into the buffer. So the last thing which I would like to show you is how you can generate x64 debug scripts. And um, as I mentioned before, these scripts are including all the patches which uh, you have done before. To demonstrate that, uh, let me manipulate this comparison where we are checking if A is bigger than uh, 5. Again, we are going to the eFlex uh, menu and uh, as far as uh, it is this time a uh, jump less equal, we have to toggle the SF flag. Okay, so uh, now we are done and now we can generate the script, uh, the x64 debug script. Now it has generated this uh, script and sent it over to the malware site, uh, so where the server is running. We can now load the x64 <coughs> debugger, go to scripts and uh, load this file. So now you can see that um, it is doing all these uh, patch tricks which you have seen before and uh, we can execute the script and now we can move to the different breakpoints. Uh, so here we have uh, we break right before uh, this comparison and uh, you can see if I'm stepping over it that it has manipulated the uh, SF flag and the comparison now thinks that A is greater than 5, uh, even if that is uh, theoretically impossible. Okay, that's it regarding the demo. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint presentation. So I hope you liked the demo and if you want to see more features, you can watch the uh, YouTube video which I have here on the bottom of the slide. As I mentioned before, the plan is to release the tool next week and uh, if you don't want to miss uh, the release, you can follow me on Twitter. With this, we have reached the Q&A section and uh, I'm giving back to the NorthSec folks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Helgar. That was a very technical and in-depth uh, talk. Maybe uh, a bit too technical for me because I am not so knowledgeable uh, in uh, reverse engineering. So we'll let a few seconds, few minutes for people to ask questions. The link has already been uh, posted. So it's uh, app.sli.do. Uh, just while waiting, just a quick message. Uh, if for whatever reason, and not just for this talk, but any talk, uh, you feel overwhelmed because it's, it's too hard for you, uh, take it as an opportunity to uh, rise curiosity and learn about these things because I know for a fact uh, that you can quickly get overwhelmed and have a feeling that uh, you're not wise enough for these things. But as you dig and uh, you try these things, uh, there is uh, not a lot of feeling as great as uh, popping your first uh, buffer overflow and having a calculator up here on your screen. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, start with the first question. So the first question from anonymous user, uh, is there any plan to make it work with Gaidra 2? Um, not in the moment because uh, my time is limited. I wish I could do that, but uh, it's not too realistic in the moment, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Uh, does it, uh, also from an anonymous user, does it also support uh, processes which are launching other processes and threads? Uh, yes and no. So uh, the command line tool uh, is supporting uh, that 
and uh, the problem with that is uh, that you can um, that you you cannot uh, lock all these uh, files at the same time. Well, you can, but uh, the IDA plugin can't uh, consume them. So um, uh, what you can do is you can run the command line tool, and it will generate uh, certain JSON files uh, per process, and uh, it will also track all the different threads of the processes. Uh, so then you can later on load these uh, JSON files manually into IDA. Okay, thank you. So I guess this brings us to the next question. Uh, what happens if I apply two different patch functions to the same instruction? Um, that is something you should usually not do uh, because uh, only one will win. Yeah? It will probably not crash uh, the um, um, it will probably not crash um, the DDR process, but um, uh, it has uh, results which uh, can't be foreseen. So um, <clears throat> I, I would not recommend doing that. Oh well, I guess it's good to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the next question from humble peon. Aren't you afraid uh, that malware detector will now try to detect it? <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> but uh, it's always uh, uh, a question of uh, if you want to release something in public or not. Of course, if I would have kept it uh, private, uh, it would be more comfortable for myself, but uh, I put a lot of time and effort into it and a lot of spare time. So uh, I thought uh, it would be nice to share it with people even taking this risk. Yeah, no, that's very good. Thank you. Thanks to you. So the, I, I guess the next question is uh, actually uh, follows. Uh, why don't you release it today? <laughs> why? Uh, because there are some organizational issues uh, which I still have uh, to overcome. Uh, like uh, how can I release it on the Talos uh, GitHub and so on. So uh, it's more organizational stuff than uh, technical stuff. Okay, so I guess like would you release it uh, with the uh, like open source free license. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I will uh, release it as an open source tool and uh, it's very likely that I will release it uh, mid of next week. Okay, so it's very, it, not yeah. today, but uh, exactly very shortly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the next question from an anonymous user, can I use uh, Dynamo Rio also for fuzzing? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for absolutely every uh, instrumentation tasks, it's a, a really recommended tool. At Perfect. From my Thank point you. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so they're telling me that my the time is over. There is uh, one other question. I'm going to ask it uh, very quickly. So is there a way to make it work with pack malware, or would you need to unpack the malware first? Absolutely. Uh, it's actually, actually the main goal to uh, uh, use it for unpacking malware. Uh, so uh, what I'm using it usually for is uh, to crack the first stage of uh, the unpacker. Um, of course, if um, if uh, you have a code which is uh, unpacking something and copying something to a buff buffer which you can't see in um, in your disassembly, um, then you probably can't um, uh, use it for the second or third stage. But that heavily depends on the case and uh, how the malware has implemented the second and uh, third stage. Uh, so uh, you can absolutely use it for everything. And uh, again, this is definitely the goal of the tool uh, to use it for unpacking malware. Perfect. That makes it very powerful. Well, thank you. That's all for the Q&A. Again, uh, a warm thank you uh, for your participation in the online event. And I wish you a great day. And I hope that you can enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we see you in, the, in a few minutes for the next talk by BX.